Well, man, I'm excited about this tonight. Uh, I want to begin in James chapter 2, but I want to give you, if I can, a little bit of an uh, a little bit of an introduction, if I can. I'm hoping this week that the Lord will let us uh, talk a little bit about uh, spiritual warfare, which is really where I had planned to be this week, but um, I was really nervous when I first started studying Ephesians because there's a lens that they saw their world through and it comes out of Ephesians 6.12, where Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's such a definitive statement. It's, I, I would, I'd have been more comfortable if he said, you know, we don't always wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But it, it's so definitive. It's, you, you know, your fight, and the word struggle literally means to fight. It's a fist fight. It's, it's um, you can trace all the cultural implications of the term <clears throat> throughout the first century. But it was, the, it was a graphic, graphic kind of fight to the death with bare hands kind of fighting. Uh, it's like life and death issue. Um, and when I first read that, I was like, you know, yeah, we get into this danger of looking for a demon under every rock kind of a thing. And then I run into Paul, Paul's other writings where he says, listen, take captive every single thought that you have. And submit it to the obedience of Christ because not every thought that comes in your mind is your thought. And that we live in a spiritual, in a spiritual war. When Jesus is cautioning, this is, I'm so excited about tonight. When Jesus is cautioning us against Phariseeism, against the Pharisee. The Pharisee was not bad. If you go back into the Old Testament and look at you know, the Pharisees who, who basically arise after the return of the Babylonian captivity and they say, we're never going into captivity again. And we're going to hold you priests and Levites to the law. I mean, they were, they were in many respects considered the heroes for a whole season of Israel's history. It's how they, they gained prominence. But when Jesus speaks about the downfall, so not all Pharisees were bad, but there was a downfall. He talks about the leaven of the Pharisees. And leaven is another term for sin. And it's literally a demonic trap. So there's a negative, there's a negative aspect of becoming a Pharisee. And the Pharisee trap, the leaven of a Pharisee, which I believe we can fall victim to today, because the Pharisee knows the scriptures, they know the routines. They're extremely dedicated. They believe. They'll die for their faith. But the Pharisee knows it here, not here. My daughter went through this. We all go through this. So my daughter was struggling with fear for a season. And I would, I would tell her, you know, I would tell her, I'd bring her back to the scriptures to remind her of who she is. And one day I'm, we're, we're talking about this and, and she goes, I know, I know. And I was like, I know that you know it, but you don't know it. Because if you knew it, you wouldn't struggle with fear. And so I meet people all the time in church who are Christians, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are saved, and they know it. They know many aspects of what they're wrestling with. They know it here, but they don't know it here. They've never experienced it. 
And sometimes it plays tricks with our theology because I think sometimes we believe that once we're saved and sanctified, which Paul covers through the first really essentially 11 chapters of Romans, we become like this finished work under a piece of glass for everybody to come marvel at. And we don't realize that in chapter 12, he says, now the real battle becomes, you know, relevant, where you are transformed on how you think. And so I meet people that, that are, they're, you're great, you're awesome, but you still have strongholds of the mind, and all a stronghold is is a lie that you believe is true. And it's like you've been set free. Paul says, listen, you've been free like now be free. So I'm consistently running into people like, and I've been through this. We've all been through this where I've been set free, but I just, the door's open. I just, I sit in there. I sit in there. And so all afternoon, I'm just sitting at home going, oh, would you hurry up? It's like there's no fast forward on the day. Because I do, I, I absolutely love for people to just to be free, like to, to be free from your past, to be free from the lies, so like just to walk away from that and just say, I'm not going to believe that anymore. I, I know who I am. And when the enemy comes and lies to me, I'm like, dude, listen, I know who I am. I know who I am. I'm not just a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. Like, wouldn't it be something if you could just... I want you to go home tonight and look in the mirror and be like, dude, I'm the man. <laughs> you kind of have to think through that, that through, but, you know, just, oh. we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Do you know that when the Father, the Scriptures tell us when the Father looks at you, He sees His Son. Did you know that when the enemy looks at you, He sees Jesus? Wouldn't it be something if you lived like it? Isn't that just incredible? I'm under this impression if we only knew who we were. If we only knew who we were. Oh, my word. One of the major deterrents for us living free is this topic of sin that's talked about in the Scriptures. And uh, I want to begin, and I'm going to look at just two passages tonight, and then we want to have a time of response. And James is such a, criti you know, a critical book in our New Testament, and I spent several years looking at it and studying it. I was just ma amazed at it because, um, in fact, if you, were, um, if you have your Bibles, and we won't, we won't have this pulled up every little reference on the, on the screen, but at the beginning of James, James opens up his letter, and he's writing, he says, in verse 1, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And you're like, 12 tribes? That sounds Jewish. Well, yeah, for the first, um, you know really 15, maybe 20 years of the early church, the church was Jewish. It was, it was Jews who had come to a Jewish festival called Passover where the Messiah died on a cross, and then that was explained to them, and the Holy Spirit convicted them of that truth at another Jewish festival called Pentecost. So it was Passover and then Pentecost. And the early church was born among the Jewish people, and 5,000 Jews were saved. I mean, really, and that continued on up through chapters like 9, 10, 11. I mean, it really, the church really didn't become, you know, kind of Gentile-centered until Rome comes in and destroys the place and everybody's taken into captivity and the church becomes primarily Gentile. But James is writing his letter uh, to those, you know, 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered among the nations. He's writing to the global church of his world by that time was really essentially Jewish. And he's using a lot of Jewish terminology. And so when you come into chap chapter 1 is all about this new covenant that God is establishing, not just with the Jewish people, but with all people. And then he begins to kind of tick down this list as you go through the, the book, the letter. And he's dealing with, with issues. And the first issue that he tackles is chapter 2, verses 1 down through verse 13. And it's the issue of favoritism. And favoritism is really easy to understand. It's not like the favoritism of our world, okay? Like, it's not bad to have... Uh, the first verse, uh, if, before I get ahead of myself, the first verse is he says, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't you dare show favoritism. 
Okay, don't show favoritism. That phrase is mentioned four times in our New Testament. And every time it refers to Old Covenant kind of roots where God doesn't show favoritism, so you and I don't show favoritism. And favoritism, you know, when you think about it, you're like, okay, I can't show favoritism. So what? I can't have a favorite, you know, music. I can't have a favorite song. I can't have a favorite friend or favorite activity. That's our understanding of favoritism. Their understanding of favoritism is actually a translation. Our, our English word is a translation of, a, of two Greek words put together. And, and they're the Greek words outward and countenance, which means favor comes from the outward. So like um, I show favoritism. So I favor you because you have money which is the illustration he uses about a man that comes in that has cash and a guy that comes in that does not. So to show favoritism is to see you and and attach value to you from the outside. So I like you because you're good looking, something like that. Um, God does not see on the outward, he sees on the heart. So running with this idea of Phariseeism again, see Phariseeism is doing the right thing. Well, God's not interested in you doing the right thing, he's interested in you being the right person. He wants you to be transformed in how you think and how you feel. Now, as he builds this understanding and he's communicating why he's, why he's talking about favoritism is this issue of sin. And he comes down to verse 9, and we really want to focus on verse 9 this evening. And he says, if you show favoritism, okay, so we know God does not show favoritism. So if you show favoritism, you and God are not alike. And if you remember this morning, what's going on in him is supposed to go on in you. How he thinks is how you're to think. How he sees is how you're to, you're to see. You're the demonstration. You were called to be the conduit by which who he is flows into the phys- our physical world. Heaven is to be released on earth through us. So if you show favoritism, you're on a different page than him. How he sees, you don't see. So he makes this statement, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. In that verse, there are two different Greek words for sin that are used. One, we actually translate sin, and the other is translated lawbreaker. Now, first off, when you get into the New Testament, you will find that there are 33 different variations for the word sin in the New Testament. There's 33 different Greek words for sin, which when I first studied that, I was like, dude, that's way too many. You got to cut that dude down. All those 33 variations come back to 10 individual root ideas, individual lexical words, root words. And to to say variations from words, what we mean is is you have like a word run, but you apply it running or ran or in Tennessee, runded. Okay, there's... There's a different, there's different ways you can apply that. So you have variations of a word that come back to a root word. So you have 33 variations of 10 different Greek words for sin. And 10 different Greek words for sin is still a lot, okay? It's still, it's still a lot. Those 10 words can be really boiled down to, scholars tell us, into really two ideas of sin that are talked about in the New Testament, okay? These two ideas for sin are represented by these two words, you with me so far? That took a lot of work. That was very difficult. Okay? So we have two different categories of sin in our New Testament. Okay? One is translated in, with this word, carry this, this one category is represented by this word we translate sin. And the other, one, other category is represented by this word we translate lawbreaker. So I want to just cover this right out of the gate. There are two ideas of sin in the New Testament. The first idea for sin is used in our verse when James says, if you show favoritism, you sin. That word is the Greek word harmatia. Harmatia. It literally means error. Means error. It's used in a variety of ways in our New Testament, but the emphasis is is really not on motive. It's on pronouncing that something is wrong. Um, I, I really believe that John Wesley when he was talking about missing the mark, he's really drawing upon the idea of this kind of sin. Okay, it's just, you know, off. Um, He uses, when we say miss the mark, he wasn't aiming at you, he's actually trying to hit the target. Okay, so he was aiming at the target, but he was just a little off. You ever meet anybody in church who's just a little off? Okay, yeah, it's error, It's, it's wrong. 
It doesn't matter if, it, if it's on purpose or not. It's just, it's a judicial term. It means wrong. It means off. So I, I've been pulled over by a police officer before for speeding. And when he pulls me over, I say, well, I'm a Christian. He says, oh, that's great. Me too. And I'm like, I didn't mean to. He's like, I understand. But you're still getting a ticket. Because <laughs> you were doing 70 in a 60 or whatever. Okay. So it was wrong. It's a judicial term. So he says, first off, if you show favoritism, there's really not any judgment here. So it's a pronouncement of being incorrect. You're operating, you know, uh, incorrectly. You're malfunctioning as a human being. You're not functioning the way God has called you to function. Why? You're showing favoritism. You're showing favoritism. So this is not a, re- it really, especially how it's used here, and we'll see this in other places this evening, but it's really not highlighting rebellion. Now, you have people that can, that, can, that can show favoritism rebelliously, but there's people that, you know, may not be. They just don't, they just naturally see improperly. So he says about this guy here in verse 9, he says, if you show favoritism, you're operating in error. And then he, then he writes, and becomes convicted. So this guy has operated in error. He's not seeing the way God sees. He doesn't feel the way God feels. He's wrong. He's not functioning the way God has called him to function. Therefore, he, he, he experiences conviction. The word conviction, as it's used in the book of Revelation, gives us, I believe, the best picture of conviction, which is an exposing. So God comes and he exposes where we're in error. So this guy is showing favoritism. He's seeing in a way that God does not see. He's viewing people in a way God does not view them. He's operating incorrectly. So God comes and he reveals that to them. He reveals that to this person. But the problem is, is this person translates into being a lawbreaker. And the lawbreaker, he enters into a different category of sin. The word lawbreaker is a compound Greek word made up of two Greek words put together. They're the words that we would translate step around, parabeno, step around. And it's a conscious decision kind of a term. It's, it's the idea that I'm walking along and there's this mud puddle here and I see it and I make a conscious de- decision to step around it. So parabeno is. Jesus uses this term, by the way, if you wonder why the Pharisees get so upset with him. He gives this parable about this Good Samaritan, okay? And there's a Jew that's been attacked, he's been robbed, he's been left for dead on the side of the road, and along come all of these religious leaders who know exactly what God wants them to do. But instead of them responding and doing the right thing, they pass by. That's this idea. And the leaders of Israel at the end of that story, if you listen, they're irate. Why? Because Jesus just said, you're living in rebellion against God. This is not accidental, what you're doing. They are deliberately saying, I don't care. So in this sentence, and that went quick, didn't it? In this sentence, James says, there's this issue of favoritism that you cannot tolerate in your life. Why? Because God doesn't show favoritism. Whatever God doesn't tolerate, you don't tolerate. Whatever he does, however he feels is how you're supposed to feel. How he sees is how I'm supposed to see. There's no differentiation between he and I. And I I love this illustration. This really helped me. And it came from the Lord a long time ago. It just kind of popped in my mind. Um, And uh, we had a a, a mentor, Dr. Stephen Manley, one day. He says, if you're a Christian, you have two people living in you. You and the Holy Spirit. You and Jesus, the Holy Spirit. I was like, that made so much sense. And I went home and I was thinking about it. And it just dawned on me that The Holy Spirit lives in my body. We share the same body. We share the same brain. Literally, he thinks. See, Jesus got a body when he entered into woman, when he entered into Mary and came out, he had a body. The Holy Spirit was like, man, I wanted a body. So the Holy Spirit was like, I know, I'm just going to take everybody else's. So literally, he lives in your physical body. God experiences what you experience. He feels what you feel. And what you and I need to do is quiet and listen for the thoughts that he has through his brain, which is also yours. Isn't that neat? So favoritism is, man, I don't want to, I don't want to entertain anything that he would not grieve him. That, that he's sharing all of this with me. So, hey, we, we don't tolerate favoritism. If you do, you're operating incorrectly. 
you're operating in error. And with this fella, God comes and says, hey, you're not operating correctly. You don't see the way I see. You don't feel the way I feel. And this guy becomes a lawbreaker, which is the most egregious form of sin talked about in the New Testament, where he looks at God, steps around God, and says, I don't care. I don't want to see the way you see. I don't want to feel the way you feel. Two categories of sin in the New Testament. There's several words that talk about this category, and there's several words that talk about this category, just like it would be in ours. We have sin, but we could also talk about mistakes. We could talk about accidents. We could talk about error. We could talk about rebellion. We could talk about lawlessness. We have a number of words that talk about these kind of concepts. So there's two categories of sin, error and rebellion. All right. Now, turn with me, if you'd be willing, to 1 John chapter 5. In 1 John, and, and one of the, I, love, I really like 1 John. If you ever want to study a book on sin, and this is probably true, <laughs> but if you ever want to study a book on sin, honestly, you can study Romans, which is probably the best book on sin we have in the New Testament. So you can study the book of Romans, and then you can be studying it the rest of your life, okay? Which is not a bad thing. Or, maybe it's kind of a, an introductory course, you can study 1 John. Because 1 John is all about the family of God operating in intimacy with God and not tolerating sin. But John, unlike Paul, and I love Paul, we, we learned this in Greek in college, that Paul Paul would invent, there's words that Paul uses in the New Testament that aren't even in secular Greek. He like makes them up. He's like, we need a new word. And like makes up words. John does not. John was not a scholar, he was a fisherman. And unlike Peter, who was also a fisherman, which ironically, scholars tell us has the most complex Greek in the New Testament, you say, I didn't know Peter was super smart. Uh, he wasn't, he had a scribe. Yeah, he was the head of the church. They were like, put that pen down. <laughs> and so he would speak and Peter would write. Well, John was on the on Patmos. He was older. He, by the time he wrote his, his gospel, he was way, he was out in, you know, in Ephesus. And, and so Paul, or excuse me, John, he writes with, with, you know, grammar, the grammar of a fisherman. He uses kind of small terminology, just real, real small words, really simple language, but he loads it with meaning. He says stuff like God is light. And there's no darkness. God is life. And in him there's no death. He's using that kind of terminology. So when he talks about sin, he uses the term harmatia, which is error. And then he uses it in different ways. Now he will imply rebellion with this term, which we'll get to. But he uses really simple language. For example, one of my, I, I like looking when I, when I read uh, and, and share 1 John. I love to, to share chapter 5, which is kind of his punchline. And specifically, specifically verses 16 and 17. So, so John writes this whole letter. And he comes down to the last chapter, just the last few verses. And he gives basically a summation. He kind of gives a summary of everything he's been talking about in a statement. It's so, it's so anointed. And I want you to listen to how he talks about sin. And this is really funny because when, when we read this, sometimes we're like, I never read that before. Or maybe I read it, but it's one, you know, my mind goes off or whatever and comes back and I miss this. Listen to how he talks about sin. He says, if anyone sees, verse, verse 16 of chapter 5, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying you should just pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. <laughs> You're like, what? There's sin that doesn't lead to death? What is he talking about? Well, let's, let's get a couple things straight at first. Okay, if you are a Christian, you have eternal, period, now and forever. If you are not a Christian, you are experiencing eternal and that will perpetuate, that will, that will grow. Okay. So when he says there's sin that doesn't lead to death, well, he's talking about there's sin that doesn't separate you from God into death. You're like, there is such a thing? Well, let's look at it. He begins and he says, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, that's harmatia. So that's, that's the error. So he's saying if you see anybody that's living in error, 
that doesn't lead to death, pray for that guy. And that idea of prayer has to do with discipleship, has to do with relationship. It's not just I'm going to pray for them, but I'm going to enter into their life and put my arm around them and walk them through. If you see someone living in error that doesn't lead to death, you're like, what do you mean error that doesn't lead to death? That's error that they don't realize is error. See, you are, on, this is so beautiful. I said this this morning, and it was kind of a collective. So let me go over it again. Everyone is born forgiven. How do you know that? Well, that's why, I mean, we, we, we don't believe like two-year-olds die and go to hell. We feel that way from sometimes. Probably, probably not. Okay. Let me rephrase that because <laughs> we're recording. Two-year-olds are not perfect. You get, yes, you get into that two-year-old and three-year-old, you're like, what did we do? Okay, kind of a thing. So they, they need corrected. They're wrong. They're, they're, I mean, you ever went by the nursery? Just see them in there beating each other with Tonka trucks and, you know, just all that stuff. And you're like, man, that's not correct behavior. Yet no one walks by the nursery and goes, man, them kids are going to hell. And get them kids saved. Yeah, we don't believe that. Seriously, we don't believe that, do we? No. Why? Well, they don't know any better. That's sin that doesn't lead to death. That's error. Yeah, they're operating in error, but they don't know it's error. Why? Because they're two. Now, there's a difference between a two-year-old and the 50-year-old in the board meeting. We're going to get to that later on this evening. Come on, you know better. See, it's, it's, it's the teenager that comes in that maybe doesn't dress appropriately. They have no idea who they are. Come on, man. Don't be judge and jury. Come on, they need discipleship. Now, he, we're, we're going to get to some of the specifics, but he comes in this book and he says, listen, if you see someone coming in and they're operating in error and they just don't know any better, disciple them. Doesn't mean they're evil. We Okay. Yeah, yeah, God does not, he's so good. God does not hold you accountable to what you don't know. Here's a, here's a beautiful statement. You are never, you will never go to hell for not being holy. You will end up in hell if you refuse to allow him to make you holy. Those are two different things. We are never condemned for not being right. We're condemned for not letting him right us. That's the, why we were sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to fight your, it's, it's, you have to fight your way out of heaven. You do. We get this idea that God's waiting to send us to hell. Hell wasn't created for us, man. <laughs> it wasn't created for you and me. It was, created for this, it was created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for you and me. And God comes and says, I've done everything, so you don't have to go there. Trust me, it's not good. Heaven's like way better. And that dude's free. You can go. And the only way you won't go is if you say, I don't want to go. Remember the story of the elder brother and the prodigal? The father comes out and he's like, dude, it's, it's, there's, it's free. We're having steaks in here. And diet soda. You could, you could come in. I don't want to. There's nothing out here. Isn't that sad? So, so, so John says, listen, if anyone sees his brother operating in error, and they're not doing it deliberately, they don't know any better, disciple them. Now, he goes on and clarifies, as he should. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is, and my translation reads, a sin, which that word a is like the B this morning. And blessed B, it's not there in the original language. There's no definite article. He's not talking about a certain type of sin. He's talking about a category. There is sin that leads to death. And what's that? There's error that people commit that leads to death. What's that? Well, that's error that I know is error and I still commit it. Yeah, I know robbing banks is wrong. And I continue robbing banks. I know lying is wrong, and I continue lying. 
I continue to live in a way that is not how God has called me to live. That's the error that leads to death. And it's interesting. He says, I'm not just saying you should pray. And let me read it literally. I am not saying that he should pray about that. We don't just pray about rebellion. We deal with it. You see someone living in rebellion, you walk up to him and say, hey, you robbing banks? Yeah, we're not good with that. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I don't think so. But you cannot live in rebellion and call yourself a child of God. We love you. Come on, you know better than this. What are you talking about? What are you doing? We love you. In fact, Paul goes as far as to confront a person. They don't listen, grab somebody else and go talk to them. If they don't listen, grab another person. That's to help carry them out. If they don't respond. And they still don't respond. Just say, listen, there's the door. Well, you're clearly not interested. Man, we love you. But this clearly isn't for you. I'm not saying that we should pray about that. Listen, he says, all wrongdoing is sin. So all error, all wrong behavior is error. But there's error that does not condemn you. I want to spend some time on that. Let's, let's go back. That's kind of the introduction. And I, it's, it's, it's good. So go back with me to 1 John chapter 1. And we're just going to look at two passages here. It'll go quick. John opens up his letter with the first, really, the first four verses focusing on Jesus. That which we have seen, which we've touched, we've watched him. Man, we've seen it, we've heard him. This is who we're proclaiming. Jesus is the good news. You and I do not have to live the way we've always lived. We don't have to be the way we've always been. We don't have to feel the way we've always felt. He is the good news. God's, God's final chapter of your life is Jesus. Seriously, he, it's Jesus. Everything, isn't that good, dude? Everything, he, everything, everything Jesus has, you, you have, man. This morning we looked at the... Um, and I got home and I realized I forgot, but we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every single blessing is what verse three says. There are two different adjectives. Well, my, my wife uses these. There's two different adjectives my wife uses, all and every. Paul says, the blessed God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every single blessing. You're like, what's the difference between every and all? It's actually from the same Greek word, pas. Sometimes all is used based on the context. Sometimes every is used. You're know, like, what's the difference? Well, it's intensity. Every is, uh, is more emphatic. It's more emphasized. For example, my wife will come in to my daughter's room, and this is a never-ending battle, but she comes into my daughter's room, you know, an hour before it's time to eat dinner. And she says to my daughter, Elena, I want all of this cleaned up before dinner. Now, unlike your children, who are perfect, she then will come back in about 45 minutes, and nothing has changed. So she will employ a different adjective. She doesn't say, I want all this cleaned up. She'll say, I want every single thing. She's, like, gifted at talking like this, by the way. She's like, I want every single thing in this room picked up. So you just don't have all the blessings. There is not one single blessing you don't have. Everything that Christ has, you have. Everything. So Jesus himself is the good news because everything he has, it's our inheritance. Oh, we could just stop right there, but we won't. So he says in the first four verses, this is who I'm talking about. And then he goes into verse five. This is so neat. And he says in verse five, this is the message we heard from him. In other words, John says, this isn't like cooked up over 40 years when he's writing this letter. It's not cooked up over 40 years of theology. That was kind of boiled out in a seminary somewhere. He says, this is, this is what he told us and what I'm going to tell you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we lie and don't live by the truth. Here's what he says. He says, listen, this Christianity is not rocket science. God is this. He is not that. If we claim to live with him... Yet we live in that, you're a liar. God is this, he's not that. If you claim to have him, yet you're bearing this kind of fruit, something is clearly wrong. Something is clearly wrong. You were called to look like him. 
You are called to feel like him. You're called to be driven by what he's driven by. And yet he comes to verse 8, which is my favorite verse in the New Testament, simply because it makes Nazarenes uncomfortable. And he says in verse 8, if we, now we is plural, so it's, it's it's applying to everyone who's reading it at the same time, including John. If we claim to be without sin, it's not in the present tense, it's in the aorist tense, which means this wasn't talking about people that he's writing to at the time. It's this blanket statement of all people at all time. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, if anyone in this room right here, right now this evening, says, hey, I have no sin in my life, you're deceived. You'd say, hold on, we don't believe in, I, I know, I know we believe. The word sin there is the word, again, harmatia, which is error. So if anyone in this room says, I, hey, I'm without error, I'm perfect, just waiting to go to heaven. <laughs> Ask your wife first, okay? <laughs> if she won't be honest with you, come talk to me or pastor, okay? If any of us says, we have no more room for growth, I'm completely perfect in every way, beyond, perf- you know, beyond perfection, beyond improvement. Come on, you're deceived. Because he's not talking about rebellion, he's talking about areas of our life where we, don't, where we don't look like him and we have no idea. By the way, this is classic Wesleyan theology. Wesleyan theology, if you were to take a timeline, he teaches on initial sanctification where you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves inside of your life, you're a new creation, you stop sinning. Then you come to this thing called, that Wesley emphasized, the second crisis point, where he talks about entire sanctification, where literally your old nature is crucified and you participate in the very nature of God, which is wonderful, which unleashes, we want to stop there, but we don't stop there, it's not sanctified and petrified, Okay? But it it literally unleashes what John Wesley describes as this whole length of time for the rest of your life until you get to ultimate sanctification. That's where you croak. From here all the way to there, he calls that growth in grace. Remember that? You don't even start to grow until you're transformed from within. Well, what's all this growth in grace about? That's all the error stuff that you don't realize is in your life that's actually in your life. And you're going to have these consistent crisis points for the rest of your life where he comes and reveals, I drive like that? I use that tone in church? I actually said it that way? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we, come on, man. We're supposed to grow. So he says, if we claim to be without error, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our errors... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our errors and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is he saying? Well, God comes to you and says, listen, you've been in, this is why you still come to church. Yeah, that's why you still come to church. That's why you still respond to the altar. See, I get nervous when I've been around people that's, well, you know, I got saved 40 years ago. And they haven't been back. What have you been doing? You haven't been back down here? Your poor wife. Seriously, you're poor kids. Because we, he reveals. We come to church and pastor preaches and the spirit moves and God reveals. And oh, I did, I call them uglies. I don't look like you. I didn't know it. I'm not living in rebellion, but wow, he revealed this area. It's not, it's not a, it's not a character flaw. It's not like a, it's like a moral deficiency in my life. That's not what he's talking about. It's a behavior. It's a thought life. It's a pattern. It's a way that I discipline my kids. It's a framework that I live by, and he reveals it. And I come forward, and I say, I had no idea that was there. And that's not how you, that's not how you look at your kids. I don't want to look at my kids that way. And he purifies me from being unright. Because if we don't respond to that, then that graduates to rebellion. Which is what he gets to when he comes to chapter 3. So he builds this case. Let me say this again really slowly. You were created to be the expressed image of the invisible God. The demonstration of what he looks like in your world. 
And so you're walking, and he transforms you from within, even when we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be, to be treated as righteous. We, we don't deserve. This isn't about merit. This is about grace. So he comes and lives in my life, and I'm absolutely in love with him. And then he comes along one day, and he reveals a thought pattern. He reveals how I, how I deal with my body. I, I went through this this summer. I was reading this book um, on, uh, on kind of the, the Christian life. And this guy was dealing with, um, he was dealing with gluttony, essentially. And he, he mentioned this, this uh, I may have even recommended this book to you, I can't remember. But he, 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 he mentions this this deal in the Old Testament where if you offer God a blemished sacrifice, it was considered an abomination. But he goes, look, there's all kinds of Christians today who offer God a blemished body to dwell in, a blemished temple to dwell in, and we think it's okay. I was like, oh, that's a little harsh. And God was just revealing to me that, you know, you, you're trashing your body. I live in here too. He's like, it's in here, it's, it's horrible. And he's like, I can hear your heartbeat every second. It's like a squishy sound. And I've been living to eat instead of eating to live. He did. I had high blood pressure. It was terrible. And God was like, you need to transform your, it's not about going and getting a pill. You need to transform how you take care of your body. And I had to respond to that. I was like, ugh. I guess I didn't realize. I just thought I was a specimen. I mean, but I'm not. And I repented because I was operating in error. And he righted me. And now I just eat stuff that tastes terrible. And it's <laughs> all the time. But if I would have looked at him and said, no, well, that's error that's now revealed to me that I continue to operate in. That's called rebellion. That's the sin that leads to death. I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't sinning. I wasn't living in rebellion. And so, and, and you, I don't know what translation you have, and some people get irritated or uptight about these different kind of um, paraphrased translation. Whether even the oldest one was a living Bible that I'm aware of. Uh, Eugene Peterson had the message back in like the, you know, the 90s, early 90s, and there's one out now, it's called the Passion Translation, and, uh, you know, I, I haven't read the whole thing, but I really like how um, this passage in 1 John chapter 4, or rather chapter 3, beginning at verse 4, how he deals with sin. Just listen to this. Just listen to this. When you don't deal with error after the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and you continue to operate in it, it becomes rebellion. Listen to how he describes this, beginning at verse 4. This is how the Passion Translation reads. It's so good. He says, anyone who indulges in sin lives in moral anarchy. For the definition of sin is breaking God's law. And you know without a doubt that Jesus was revealed to eradicate sin. And there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in union with him will not sin. But the one who continues sinning hasn't seen him with discernment or known him by intimate experience. Delightfully loved children, don't let anyone divert you from this truth. The person who keeps doing what is right proves that he's righteous before God, even as Jesus is righteous. But the one who indulges in a sinful life is of the devil. Get that. The one who indulges in error is of the devil. Because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, everyone who is truly God's child will refuse to keep living in error. Because God's seed remains within him and he's unable to continue living in error because he's been fathered by God himself. So here's how God's children can be clearly distinguished from the children of the evil one, evil one. Anyone who does not demonstrate righteousness and show love for fellow believers is not living with God at his source. <laughs> That's remarkable. It's incredible. There are two types of sin mentioned in the New Testament. Categories of sin. The first is error. We are born askew, broken, wrong. We operate incorrectly. If you don't believe that, walk past the nursery. 
just look in there. They're not evil. <laughs> they're broken. And God loves them. And they're going to come to a point where some people have called it the age of accountability, where God's going to reveal them, dude, you're a mess. You need to let me in your life because I want to transform you starting from within. I don't want to transform you here. I want to transform you here. And this right here will catch up. I want to move inside of your life. I want to participate with you. I want to share your body. And then he begins to unravel us. He cleanses our heart, but then he begins to unravel how we think. But if you come to a point in your life where he puts his finger on something and says, I don't want you thinking this way. Why don't you see him this way? And you say, no, that's rebellion. That places you naturally under judgment because God has reserved heaven for people that look like him. And if you don't want to look like him, there's another place you can go to. So God doesn't send you there. He begs you not to go there. Dude, you can come with here. You can come with me. But everyone that comes here is going to look just like me. I don't want to look like you. Are you sure? I want you to. No. Well, there's another place over there. And ultimately, the whole, the whole New Testament rings with this really strange idea that those who don't look like him won't want to go there. They're, they just don't, they don't like what he likes. All right, that's, that's the basis. Quickly, error. Let's, don't look, let's, let's sit error over here for a second. Rebellion. If, if you're living in rebellion, if you're... Um, if you're, if you're sexually immoral, if you're operating in pornography, pornography actually is a Greek word. Most people, most people don't know that. Porn is, is from a Greek word. I had a team one time say, really? I was like, yeah. They're like, when, so when the porn industry started, they went and did a Greek word study, and it's demonic, dude. We translate the word pornography in the scriptures, sexual immorality. It's ungodly sexual activity. That's what sexuality, that's what, that's pornonia is. It's fornication. It's, it's ungodly sexual intimacy. If you want to know what God does not desire for you and what will bring death in your marriage, watch porn. Okay, so when you're, when you're wrapped up in that lifestyle and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you continue, you're living in rebellion against God. And, it's, it, it, it's, and we think of sin condition as, okay, I just won't watch that anymore. Sin is leaven. It gets through the whole deal of your life. And it tra the worst thing about sin is it fathers you on how to think. Remember the fathering language he just used here? See, we are being fathered by God. He's working, we're working out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. We're responding to being transformed into his likeness. Well, when you're operating in sin, you're also being fathered. I had this boy come to me. Actually, it's his mother. It's very embarrassing for all of us. But we was at this camp. It was a family camp. They had these teen ser services. He had went to the teen services. And she had got on his phone or found his phone or he got a text or something, opened it up, and he'd been in porn. So she walks right down to the teen services. I was doing the adult tabernacle stuff. So she gets, the, gets, the, gets her son and comes to my bus afterwards. Corinne and I are in there. And she just knocks on the door and makes herself at home aggressive southern women and uh she does she drags her son in he's humiliated she throws down his phone and all of this and and he's he he was not an evil kid he's just you know deceived and lost and a mess and probably some family stuff there dad wasn't anywhere at camp wasn't interested in being there it's just there's a, probably a lot going on but he he repented he had, a, he had an encounter with jesus but she really acted like at the end of the week it was all kind of tied up and done and gone. And it, that's not how it is. He's going to have to be transformed because he's got strongholds here. You're like, what do you mean? Well, okay, he, so he never watches porn again. Fine. The problem is he's going to get married one day and he's been fathered on how to view sexuality. Which means one day when he gets married, that's how he's going to expect his wife to act. See, sin is, be that's why call Paul says in Romans, sin becomes your tutor. Sin becomes your teacher. I mean, I mean, so many people, they do. They get saved, all this stuff, it's great. But then they're never, and they're like dysfunctional. 
They're dysfunctional in their humor. They're dysfunctional in the, the way they talk to their spouse. They're dysfunctional in the way... They got prob- Are they forgiven? Absolutely. Saved? Absolutely. But they're filled with error and malfunction. If you want to operate in brokenness and you want to absolutely obliterate future relationships, marriages, work ethic, live in rebellion. You can't tolerate saying no to Jesus in your life. It's not just an event. It's not just something that I'm not going to do anymore. Okay, I did that for a while. I'm not going to do it. That's not how sin works. It's not just physical. If it was physical, God could have corrected Adam and Eve. There's a, there's a, there's a pollution. There's the stain. He wants to fully not only transform you from the inside, but transform the way you think. Romans chapter 12 is after 1 through 11. Error is tricky. See, error, it can come out of rebellion, and you've been taught, like that young man, he's going to have to be, go through what the New Testament calls deliverance, transformation, healing of the mind. He's going to have to be renewed. That's an ongoing process. Error also comes out of trauma and abuse. I, uh, I met so many people that I met a girl at a, at a camp. Actually, this was in, it wasn't even at a camp. It was at a big youth thing over in, in, not too far from here. It was actually at, the, at Hereford when we was at the D-NOW conference. And this girl had come there. And after one of the services, she'd, she'd come up and she said, can I talk to you? And she was clearly bothered, and, and I could tell she was under duress. There was some trauma. She was, she was reliving. And uh, I said, yeah, let me grab Victoria. That's, that's uh, Aaron's wife, the youth pastor's wife. And I was waiting on her, and I was sitting there kind of chit-chatting with her, and Pastor Ted comes up. I said, hey, Ted, come here. I want to help me with this. And then Victoria came over, so we all three went in the room, and, and in this one room, and we were just sitting and talking, and she just opens up. She says, in the service, the Lord just really revealed to me. She goes, I'm, I'm believing lies. Like the Lord just revealed that to her, and she just opened up. And I was expecting some type of deep, terrible trauma going on in her life. She said, back when I was in sixth grade, I came into this um, locker room, and there were all these eighth grade girls, and they just begin to, you know, be belligerent, and they begin to just speak horrible things about me. And she goes, I just, I believed them. I came into agreement with them. So in other words, in a manner of speaking, she committed favoritism. Yeah, she believed about herself something God didn't believe. That would be called sin. Well, hold on. She didn't do anything wrong. No, no, she did something wrong. She just didn't rebel. Folks, this is really important. Some of you have done this. Some of you have been abused. And you've come into agreement with lies, not even knowing they're lies. And this girl lived in it. She was like 16. She lived in it since she was in sixth grade. And she said, when you were talking tonight, the Holy Spirit revealed to me. She went, she didn't say Holy Spirit. She said, God spoke to me. And I, I'm not that person. And we got around her and, and just prayed for her. And she came out. We're going to do, I did with her what we're going to do with you tonight. And she stood up and cried and said, I'm free. And it wasn't like this emotional, she was set free There was, if you want to call it something let go, something stopped speaking. I don't know how, what, whatever's theologically going to work for you. She said no to that, and I don't believe that anymore. And she said, I just felt the Lord wash over me. I was in Fort Worth um, just the middle of February, and this this woman come, so it's confidential, but this woman, this woman came, won't tell your name, but she was invited, there's this rascally, shouldn't say rascal, but this ornery, that's the right term, little 80-year-old woman, they're ornery. And she had deliberately tricked her neighbor into giving her a ride. This is so cool. She's like, I, I'm too old and infirm. I need a ride to church. So guilted this lady to give her a ride to church. So she came to church, and she had grown up. She'd new to the area, moved there, and she'd been raised in Catholicism. And 
after the service, we, did, we had this tremendous, tremendous evening. And in fact, I think we were looking at sin there, and people came forward, and they, I mean, it was just awesome. After the service, I came, and she was just sobbing, sobbing. And I, I thought it was healthy, a healthy thing. So the next night, she comes back without that lady. Okay, she, just, she didn't give her a ride. She just came by herself. She came in, and she was still sobbing, and she said, I didn't go to work. I was up all night, and I immediately realized something's not healthy. So I grabbed pastor's wife, Becky Glidden, and I pulled, pulled this lady aside. And I, said, what's, I said, I'm sorry. What, did it something I do? What's going on? And she was a little agitated. She goes, I, I buried all this stuff years ago. I was like, hold on. Okay. You can't bury stuff. You, you can't bury stuff. You can't bury weeds that come out. And she did. She said, I, I buried this stuff 30 years ago. And I went through counseling for years and medication, learned how to deal with it. And last night I went through and I came out of agreement. It all came back. I was like, it didn't come back. It was always there. And as we begin to talk, the marriages she's been through, all this brokenness, she's just lived with coping with brokenness. She coped with error. And it all came back to some horrendous abuse that she suffered when she was like eight. And she, she's been, she, she messaged me. It's been a month. She's, she's been going through uh, Steps of Freedom with Becky. And, and she, she messaged me, and she goes, for the first time in 60 years, I'm free. <laughs> I know, dude. She wasn't bad. She wasn't evil. Oh, I'm glad she got saved. Dude, come on. She loved Jesus. Jesus lived in her heart. She's just broken here. Come on, man. She believed lives. And the enemy just had a hold. It just could steer her. Some of you believe lies about yourself. And I get it. A lot of us, my age and older, come from a generation where we just don't talk about things and we forget about it. We, we sweep it under the well. It's going to be, that's not biblical. No one ever quits error. You have to be delivered from error. No one quits sinning. You have to be saved from sin. You don't just quit. I mean, I meet people. They're not bad. And I really think that the enemy gets them operating in circles here with their theology and what's people going to think and are they going to think I'm saved and just, does that even sound like the Holy Spirit to you? Not at all. You can be washed as white as snow. There is rebellion. You, come on. We, don't, we all know that. No, you can't live there. But there's trauma. There's error. There's brokenness. Where you come into agreement, you believe things. I, I, had, I had terrible views when I was a kid. I just went through this with, with a friend of mine in December. And the Lord just opened it up. And I mean, it's a long story and none of your business. But I did. I, 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 had, I believed some things about me. And I just, the Lord just brought it up. And I'm like, where did that come from? And it's always been there. That's why we were talking about, that's why I use sarcasm. I, don't, I can't use sarcasm anymore. I can't. Dude, I'm growing. <laughs> I'm growing like a weed. He's, I'm in this process of just him writing me. Just transforming my heart. I thought your heart was transformed. I know. Stuff just comes out of my mouth. I don't know what I'm saying. Transforming my mind. I feel different. I'll give you one more. So I'm at, at camp this summer at the West Texas District Camp, meeting the family camp. And this girl, this is how easy it is. After one of the services, this girl comes forward. And this backstory, which is real quick, the backstory was she's there with a friend um, and her mom. And mom had heard me somewhere in Texas. I don't even know where she was. I think she was from Lantana, maybe. But she had come to camp. Okay, she wanted to come to camp for at least three or four days, and she wanted her daughter to come. And her daughter said, I ain't going to go and hang out with a bunch of old people. And I, you know, and so she bribed her, as every good parent does. And said, there's, you know, there's swimming pool there, there's fun stuff, and you can bring a friend. 
And she says, okay, I'll bring my good friend from school. Well, her good friend from school came, and that's the girl. She had no church background, no nothing, pretty good kid, all of this stuff. And she comes, and after one of the services, she comes forward, and she's standing over to the right, and she's just waiting on me. I could tell. So I come up, and I was like, hey, what's up, girl? And she's, she's trembling, and she goes, can I talk to you? I was like, absolutely. So I grab Amanda Pettit, who's out of Dallas, and uh, we sit down in the front row and pull the chair up, and I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, I don't understand what you're talking about with Jesus. And she had never read the Bible, never knew anything. And, of course, Amanda jumps into gear, and she's like, well, you could know him. He can come in your life. And she was totally closed off. I don't trust. Had all these. She was really skeptical. And we kind of went in circles for about 10 minutes on that. And I kid you not, this doesn't happen all the time with me, but I heard the Lord. He said, just introduce me to her. I was like, what? And I was like, what if you don't show up? I'm going to look like an idiot. This literally was my fear. And so I looked at her and I said, listen, let's not argue about this. I said, do you want to meet him? And she looked at me and she was like, excuse me? I was like, I know. I, have to, I, t- I hope this works. <laughs> That's literally what I was thinking. I was like, do you want to meet him? No strings attached. This is not a date. You want to just meet him? I'm not asking, you don't have to ask him in your life. You want to meet him? And she goes, yeah, I'll meet him. And I took her hand and I took Amanda's hand and I just said, it came to me and I just said, Lord, introduce yourself to her like you did to me in 1995. Knock her socks off. And I'm not kidding you, I felt his presence come. <laughs> it was incredible. It was a short prayer, very unspiritual. And I opened my eyes, and she's staring at me, smiling. And I said, uh, oh, no, it gets better. I looked at her, and I went, do you sense that? And she goes, I said, that's not a feeling. That's a person. I said, how would you like to trade that feeling for what you're feeling on the inside? And she goes, okay. And she invited that person to come inside and that girl was different the rest of the week. I think she came to teen camp. You just don't have to continue to carry around and feel the things you're feeling. That's not natural, what you're feeling. That's not natural. Well, in this life, we'll have trouble. Stop taking passages out of context, please. You don't have to carry that around anymore. You can be free. It's really not complex. It's not, that, it's not that impressive. And what's beautiful, at this point in the service, the Holy Spirit is already going ahead. I've seen it so many times. It's so neat. He's going ahead and he's revealing to you the junk that you're carrying around. The self-loathing. One of the things I've, that, that's been, that, that the Lord's been correcting me as of late is I'm always looking... I don't know how to even explain it to you. I've always considered myself an introvert, but I'm not. I love people. But I always feel so awkward around them because I think that they don't like me. I'm saying the wrong thing or I say the wrong. I'm I'm super critical of myself. And that's what started to change in December. Jesus is like, why do you think that about yourself? I was like, I don't know. Doesn't everybody? (laughs) He's like, I don't. And I, I don't know where I picked that. I know where I picked that up. And so what I did is, is I came out of agreement with that. So what we're going to do is tonight, we're, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just, I want, you to, I want you to break up with the enemy. Seriously, I want you to invite him out to dinner and say, listen, this is not working out. I need some time apart. Because I don't agree with how you see me. I just don't agree with that. I'm dating someone else, by the way. He's wonderful. And I agree with how he sees me. And when he comes back, I don't agree with that. That's how you, that's, that's the war. That's the struggle. We'll talk about this this week. People talk about spiritual warfare. Jesus won the war. I don't know if you know that or not. Yeah, Jesus won the war. It's, it's won. Okay, we're in Christ. We're seated in the, in Christ above every principality and power, above everything. 
We're seated with him. Right. So the war is over. Well, what's the struggle? I just don't believe the lies. Yeah, Jesus didn't go into town looking for demons. You're not a demon hunter. To the child of God, the enemy is absolutely insignificant. He's just, he's, an, he, he's, he's not even a thought. He's not even an afterthought. He's irrelevant. I don't listen. The idea of resist means, oh, stop. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Because I know who I am. And if the enemy comes, Jesus wants you to live in the present with him, practicing his presence. If he, if he reminds you of your past or tries to threaten you with fear about your future, it's always of the enemy. He's so easy to, he's so easy to diagnose. He doesn't sound like Jesus. He's the accuser. And you can just say, I, don't, I just don't agree with that. Sorry, I don't agree with that opinion in the name of Jesus. I agree with your opinion. I don't even talk to him. I just say, I don't agree with that. I don't know where that came from. I agree with you. And he just, that, he just freaks out and runs. So what, what I would love to do with you tonight is just, I'd like you to walk you through coming out of agreement with some of the things that you've been exposed to, some of the hurts, some of the things that we believe about ourselves in trauma. The enemy comes. It's interesting, when Jesus was in the wilderness and, he, and, and, and the enemy flees, it says he waited for a more opportune time. So what happens is he comes to you in the midst of abuse and trauma and pain, and he speaks a lie. And oftentimes we grab it because it sounds right. I hate that person. I'm so stupid. None of that is true. And when you come into agreement with that, you partner and give him permission to be there. So what you need to do is say, I come out of agreement with that perspective, like vocally. I, I come out of agreement with that. You have to, I, re, I repent. I, I, I confess. I confess that I've come into agreement. While I come out of agreement, I confess that. I confess I did that. I come out of agreement. I, I, I repent. And I come into agreement with, with you. Leave. And you're free. It sounds way too easy. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I think Sean's going to come, but no one's looking around. Listen, it doesn't get any easier than this. Grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, college student, teenager. Please don't miss your moment. No one's looking around. Just let's invite him. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, seated at the right hand of our Father in heaven. Open our minds. Father, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. If you've been living in rebellion and you've been living in sin, I want you to raise your hand and then you can put it right back down for anybody sees. Raise your hand, put it right back down. All right, let's confess that. Jesus, and, you, and under your breath, it needs to be out loud. Jesus, I confess. And this is what I confess, this is what I did. And I repent. I've been operating in rebellion. You've been talking to me about this. I've probably... And what I'm hearing, if I can say that, if you, if you allow me to say that, what I'm hearing is a lot of you have been operating in rebellion. You're meeting a need in your life. And that need, Jesus wants to meet it. And there's going to be a learning curve there. You're going to have to enter into relationship with someone in accountability because you're going to learn how to let Jesus meet that need. So you've been doing harm to yourself. And don't worry when you say after this is over, I don't feel anything. Most of you, because of the pain, when you don't feel anything, you shut down your emotions so you don't feel anything, so you feel numb. So you're probably going to walk out here and say, I didn't feel anything. Well, that's natural. You've been doing that for a long time to survive. Emotion's not bad. Emotion's a good thing. It's so neat to be emotional, to have joy and laughter and even mourning sorrow, some of that's healthy. We shut that down because of trauma. I don't want to feel this way. So Jesus, we, we, we would confess and I repent 
I turn from my sin. I turn from saying no to you. And I ask you, Jesus, not just to come inside and bring forgiveness, which you want to do. I want you to bring healing in this area where confession has taken place in the name of Jesus. I want, to bring, I want, you, to bring, I want you to bring healing in my life. Now, Holy Spirit, there's, there's some here that haven't been living in rebellion, but they've lived in trauma, and they've had some really difficult seasons with, with depression, with hard feelings, unforgiveness, fear, anxiety, settling for less in marriage. You are so good. You restore what was lost. You want us to have life and have it to the fullest abundantly. Holy Spirit, come and take us back in the name of Jesus. Let him lead you and guide you. Take take us back, Holy Spirit, right now to that place where we came into agreement. Jesus is going to lead you back to where you came into agreement with what you're feeling, the pain that you suffered, He's going to take you back. He's going to take you back and say, this is where you came into agreement. This is what you said. You probably made a covenant statement. You made a declaration. I'm not going to, or I am this. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Anybody's having that right now. Anybody can see that. Just raise your hand where it happened. You can put it back down. (laughs) Just say this under your breath, out loud. Jesus, I come out of agreement with what I said. I was hurt. I was desperate. I was afraid. I was mad. I was angry. I was lost. I was deceived. I come out of agreement with you, oppressing spirit. In the name of Jesus. Say that. I come out of agreement with you, oppressing spirit. I come out of agreement with you, lying spirit. I confess, Father, that I had come into agreement. But I repent right now in the name of Jesus. And then say this. I come into agreement with your destiny for me. Say this. I come into agreement with how you see me. Restore to me the joy of my inheritance. And then declare, in the name of Jesus, lying spirit, leave. Say it. Say, go away in the name of Jesus and don't come back. We're going we're gonna to spend some time. Some, some of you are going to need to respond. Dude, this is a good thing. And we're all going to kind of blend together those who've been hurt, those who've lived in rebellion, those who've been through trauma, those who've, come on, we're all going to be here. But some of you need to come, maybe some of you need to come forward and just kneel. In fact, you probably need to reach over to your husband or reach over to your wife and say, would you just come pray with me? I want to concrete this right now physically. Would you come? Come on, it's okay. Do you know when James says, confess your sins among one another, you may be healed? That's, that word is error. Yeah, I've been hurt. It's okay. Yeah, I'm a 65-year-old manly man. I've been hurt. I'm okay. You can come if you want. And if you, if you just absolutely say this, I can't. I can't. I'm not there yet. You need to tell somebody. So after service is over, Sean, Pastor Sean's going to be here. Uh, Pastor Lori's going to be here. I'm here. Um, Gary is here. His, his wife I don't know if you have a youth pastor. You need to come and tell somebody, dude, I'm safe. I'm gone on Thursday. But you need to declare it. You need, I don't, we don't need to know your business. I don't need to know details. But you need to say, listen, I went through something a long time ago that I didn't even know was there, but God revealed it tonight. And I came out of agreement with it. And I just feel his presence wash over me. <laughs> I'm free. Say it out loud. I've been, been set free, man. I don't agree with that anymore. I'm not going to listen to that lie anymore. I'm not going to let that lie manipulate emotion in my life. I'm not going to pass that on. I'm not going to subject my family 
I'm a new, I'm a new person. I'm going to change the way I talk. I'm not going to use, for me, I'm not going to use crude, crass humor anymore. Because I don't, I, I'm not going to be that way. I'm not going to be the center of attention anymore. I don't need that. I'm not evil. I love Jesus. I've just operated out of brokenness for so long. I've operated in survival mode. That's what we do. I love Jesus. I just end up operating in survival mode. Listen, I get it. I understand. And I've had to correct myself because when I first started talking about this, I was looking at people saying, you know what? It's not your fault. And in a manner of speaking, it's not. The little child that gets taken advantage of, it's not their fault. They respond in trauma. Did they respond correctly? No. But they come into agreement with lies and then they live and they live as, they live as slaves. Jesus says, I come to set the captives free. I literally come to set captives free. And even error can keep you captive. So I, I am, I'm just, man, I'm so happy for you. I, just, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'm, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> These are great days. This is what revival is, right? When you walk out here and go, I think I'm different. This is what we call an encounter with the Most High God. Like it's two Mack trucks in my life going whack. And I feel different. Anybody have that? Anybody have that tonight? Let's, let's take some time. Sean's going to lead us. Pastor Sean's going to lead us. We're just going to sing to him. We're going to put our, our, our praise and thanks and appreciation in words. It literally makes the enemy flee. You need to tell someone what's been going on in your life. I saw a lot of hands go up. Good for you. Let's stand and praise him. If you want to come down and pray with someone who's been here, don't press. Don't press. Don't ask questions. You can do that. Let's worship.